Well, good morning. Uh, like you heard, my name is Barak. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm really excited to be here this morning. I'm usually at Creekside, uh, but today I have the pleasure of being here uh, with you at, uh, at the, uh, the two seasons. I keep forgetting that we've changed names. <laughs> Uh, so if you're at Platinum, if you're seated anywhere, well, thank you for joining us. Thank you for choosing to spend your Friday morning with us. And I'll be continuing with our series on, uh, on Take My Junk. Now, I don't know whether you remember the first time you spoke. I don't know whether you remember the first words you spoke. When, when, when you have kids, um, and, and you may not remember the first time you spoke, but your parents may very well remember the very first words you spoke. Uh, they, they, they just, you, you hang on to them, you wait for them to say them. Um, and I, I've told you guys before that I'm an uncle to 13 nephews and nieces. Uh, the title uncle is the most expensive title on earth. Um, <laughs> I know, and I love spending time with my nephews and nieces. Um, and once I was visiting my two nieces, and, and uh, one of them really loves apples. She's called Catrill, the one in blue. She really loves apples. And the other one is called Nemo. And, and Nemo doesn't know how to, didn't know how to talk at that time. And, and so Catrill walks up to me and says, Uncle Barak, I'd like an apple. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I walk to the kitchen, uh, peel an apple for her, give it to her, and go back to my computer, sit down to continue working. And then Nemo, after a few minutes, walks up to me, tags on my trousers and goes like, papa, 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 papa. Like, <laughs> what? Like, papa, 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 papa. Like, what are you trying to say? And the more I asked, the more agitated she got, and the more she wanted me to understand what she's saying. And so I asked her, what are you saying? Papa, 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 papa. So I asked the sister, what is your sister trying to say? She said, Uncle Barak, I want an apple. You <laughs> should have said so. <laughs> Words help us communicate. Words help people know what we feel inside and what we think. And then when people don't understand what we are saying, it actually affects us. How we use our words changes the mood of the conversation. Words are extremely important. Words um, change what we think, tell people what we want, and we can use words to build or to break. Words heal and words hurt. You may know people who use their words to hurt and others who use words to heal. You could have been going through a hard time and someone just told you the right words at the right time. And they told you it, it'll be okay. And, and that, those words were like wind in your sails and, and they were the words you needed to be carried through the next season of life. Or, or you may remember a time you were fighting or arguing with a person you loved and, and they just told you, I'm sorry. And, and those were the words you needed to hear at the right time. Or you may be thinking of, of words a teacher, a coach, or a parent said to you in anger when they said, you will never amount to anything. And then those words have been with you ever since. And then you've been trying to prove those words wrong. You've been trying to make sure that people know that you are amounting to something. And every single day of your life, you've tried to either live up to those words or not. Words change opinion. Words sway a nation. Words transform people. Words divide opinion. Words and how we use words just define who we are. We use words to worship, we use words to pray, we use words to express love and to show people what we mean. And even as we consider words, words actually show who our true nature is and show who we really are. In fact, this is what Jesus says to the Pharisees. He says to them, for out of the abundance of the heart, their mouth speaks. He is telling them that how you speak actually defines who you are. It shows us the content of your heart. Over the last four weeks, we have been talking through the series, Take My Junk. And, and we've talked uh, through, for example, we talked the first week, we talked through greed and what that looks like. And then how we were asking God to take the junk of greed from our lives. Uh, the, we, then we talked about sexual sin and Warwick told us about the, the, the junk of lust that we carry around and asking God to take that. And then Pastor Bill told us about anger. And, and he spoke through what that looks like for us to just submit that to 
God and asking us that question of what do we think we are owed. And today we are going to just go back to that passage of scripture in Colossians. And in particular today, I want us to look at what it has to say about words and then what Paul is writing here. He says, uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 to 11. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On the account of this, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is no Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and is in all. Let us pray together as we begin. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to stand before your people to share your word. Lord, I thank you for um, how, as we learn this, Lord, we have an opportunity to learn, to grow, to be different. So, Lord, I pray that you'll prepare their hearts and prepare my heart as well to hear from you. Lord, most importantly, I pray that you'll give me the courage to step out of the way and to allow you to minister to your people for your glory and our joy. In Jesus' name, amen. And Paul writes to the Colossians, and he actually uses um, a, a particular phrase. He says, put to death. It's, it's very interesting that he actually says it that way. And he, basically, he's telling the Colossians, and by extension, he's telling us that you need to ensure that these things are dead to you, and you are dead to them. He uses death as an example of how these things should be. And, and in essence, what he's trying to say is that when something is dead, it desires nothing. And when you are dead to something, you desire nothing. And basically, what, what, what Paul is trying to say is, because these things are dead to you, you should have nothing to do with them, and it should be different. Paul tries to focus on these words. He tries to focus on the idea that you must put these things to death. And he keeps on saying that put what that you have in your old self with its practices away from you. Paul is trying to say that you as a follower of Christ, you as a follower of Jesus Christ, he's reminding you that now that you have said you are a follower of Christ, there must be a marked difference between you and those who are not. There must be a marked difference between you and who you are before you became a follower of Christ. You have to live a totally different way that defines your life today. Notice how he says it in the passage. He's urging them again, put to that and put off our former practices the way we once walked when we were living without Christ. And then he says, and put on the new self. So he tells them what to put off and what to put on. But still, Paul is very careful to remind us that it is God who does the changing. It is God who does the transformation. Notice he actually says it this way in verse 8. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. And then verse 10, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of the creator. What Paul is saying is the more you spend time in Scripture, the more you spend time reading the Word of God, the more you spend time with God and with His people, the more He transforms you more and more to His image and to be more like Him. Paul is trying to remind us that this is not what you do, but what God does through you. This, Paul is trying to tell us that it's not you coming before people saying, hey, look at me, look at how much I've changed. Instead, it is look at what God has done in my life, that he is continually transforming me to be more like him. So Paul is careful to remind us that, yes, you need to put these things off. And how do you do that? You do that by continually submitting yourself to God and allowing him to transform you into his image. The problem, though, is whether or not you are a follower of Christ, words affect us all. 
Words have an impact on each and every one of us. It does not matter whether you are a follower of Christ or not. It doesn't matter whether this is the first time you have come to a church or you ended up here by mistake because a friend dragged you here. You don't know why you're here and you don't know what this message means. And you thought to yourself, well, he's talking to those who claim to be followers of Christ. That's not me. It doesn't affect me. Actually, if someone says you are a fool, it doesn't matter whether you believe in Jesus or not, those words will affect you. And when you say certain things, it doesn't matter whether you're saying it to a follower of Christ or not, whoever you say them to, they affect them. So what I want us to see today is how our words have an impact on everyone and they also affect our lives as well. It's not just about those who are followers of Christ only, but every one of us. And I would like us to look at the book of James. Because James writes it in a different way. He makes it clear. He reminds us how our words and how we use them, either to lie, slander, gossip, praise, encourage, or bless, these affect everyone, not just followers of Jesus, everyone, each and every one of us. And I'd like us to read together and just see what James says. And I'm going to read from uh, James chapter 3. And then this is what the Word of God says. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the wheel of the pilot directs. So also, the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is, is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set amongst our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Father, our Lord and Father, and with it, we cast people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. James is reminding us here of this particular fundamental truth that how we use our words or if we learn how to control our words, then we can control our lives. And he builds towards it in four different ways. And I want us to see how he gets there. But what I want you to understand particularly today is this, how we use our words and if we learn how to control our words, then we could actually control our lives. And the first thing James actually says is, we all stumble. James starts off by reminding us that each and every one of us is at fault. We all stumble. He actually puts it this way, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. James starts off by saying that even those who stand before you to teach, even them, they struggle with their words. What I want you to see is this message is not me standing in front of you and wagging my finger at you saying, you guys need to do better. It's actually saying, we are all struggling. Each and every one of us struggle with how we use our words. In fact, James continues and he says, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle, his, to bridle his whole body. James is trying to remind us here that each and every one of us needs to watch our words. It's not for some, 
It's not for those guys. It's not for those who are not followers of Christ or those who are followers of Christ. It is each and every one of us. And he actually says that those who are not, who don't stumble in this way, they are actually perfect. And then he uses this particular word. He says, you're also able to bridle your whole body. Why does he use that word? See, the bridle is, is a simple piece of metal that is put inside a horse's mouth. And then with it, they use it to direct the horse. If they want it to go right, they pull that way. If they want it to go left, they pull that way. If they want it to slow down, they pull it back. Now, now I don't know the last time you, you rode a horse. I haven't. Uh, and <laughs> so maybe that doesn't make sense for you. The easiest way to understand it is really to think about a vehicle and a steering wheel. You see, the, the, when, when you turn it right, the car left, the car goes left. When you turn it right, the car goes right. Uh, w- what James is trying to tell us here is the same way when you point the steering wheel in a certain direction, the whole vehicle goes in that direction, is the same way when you point your words in a certain direction, your whole body follows. James is trying to tell you your body follows your words. Where your words go, your body goes as well. And then James is careful to remind us that there is a problem here with how we use our words. And there is an impact of your words in people's lives. Do you know the impact your words have? Have you ever thought about it? Have you ever given thought to it? See, some of us know already the impact of our words. We know that we say things that hurt people, but we have a get-out-of-jail-free card in our pockets. The moment we say whatever we want to say, the moment we realize it has hurt the person, you go like, hey, I'm just joking. It wasn't serious. You're too sensitive. And, And you know that the reason you are saying it was to hurt them, but now that you cannot deal with the consequences, you're offering yourself a way out quickly. I was just joking. Or for you, you're the brave kind that actually says, actually, I'm saying it like it is. No, you're not. You're hurting, guys. And and you know that. And for some of us, it's not how we speak to each other, but how we use our words online, how we tweet or how we chat in groups. Yes, you may not speak them out, but how you type and what you type and how it affects people is different. And then James is saying, we need to watch our words. We need to watch what we say, how we say it, and when we say it, because each and every one of us is at risk of stumbling on this. It's a risk all of us face. The next thing James says is, our words can either control or destroy. This is how he puts it in verse 3. He says, if we put uh, bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, and he goes back to the idea of a bridle. He says, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the wheel of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. In Africa, we actually say, uh, until the lion knows how to speak, the warrior will always be the hero of the story. You see, when when the warrior comes home from killing a lion, he'll tell you how, hey, the lion was this big and it was attacking me, it was running towards me, It, it, it was the roar, you could hear it for three kilometers. He will not tell you that the lion was asleep and he snuck up on it. He will not. He will not, we, we just like to add things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set amongst our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. I see, in the former two illustrations, James tells us about animals and he tells us about ships. And he's telling us that how these things are controlled by such a small part of, of their bodies. And then he continues to a different illustration telling us about a forest and how a huge forest can be burnt by such a tiny spark. And he's trying to tell us, likewise, the tongue can either control your life 
or destroy your life. He's trying to tell us that there could be positive and there could be negative as well. He offers us an opportunity to consider the difference our words have. You see, fire in and of itself is not dangerous. It's not bad. It's good for, for your life. When you use it well, it's, it brings a lot of good. But when you use fire in a bad way, it brings a lot of damage. How we use our words actually has a significant impact on our lives and in the lives of the people around us. But particularly, what James is trying to say here is it has an impact on your life, yourself. See, when, when I was preparing this message, I thought, let me do a bit of research and find out whether any science, any scientists have tried to figure out what, what is the impact of words, what is the impact of lying, what is the impact of how we use our words. And it's very interesting. I found that there are eight different papers from different uh, reputable universities just working through what this is like. And it was very fascinating. The research was just amazing. And, and one of the things I found, that one of the research papers said actually that uh, research shows that the more you lie, the easier it gets and the more likely you are to do it again. I was like, yeah, you don't need research for that. We, 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 we know that. The second thing that I, they found was this. The dangerous thing about lying is people don't understand how the act changes us. It actually changes who we are. And a different paper puts it this way, and I'll read it for you because it's, it's just amazing what they found. On one hand, telling the truth, being altruistic, acting fairly, and being generally other-oriented are virtues directly linked to a suit of positive health outcomes such as better health and physical wellness, lower stress, decreased cellular aging, increased physiological uh, well-being, uh, and longevity of life. On the other hand, lying, being selfish, cheating, engaging in infidelity are associated with a suit of negative health outcomes, such as elevated heart rate, heart rate increased blood pressure, vascular constriction, elevated cortisol, and a significant depletion of the brain regions needed for appropriate emotional and physiological regulation. What these guys are saying and what they found is the more you use your words in a negative way, the more your health is affected. It actually affects you. It rewires your brain. It rewires as your whole body, you change, and it is affecting you. It's funny because as I read this, other researchers actually said that we can't, we don't know exactly the impact of this. Another research said that this area has not been studied. We've left this for theologians and preachers, and now is when they're coming to it, and they're finding that how we use our words actually affects our health. It's funny how science today is saying this 2,000 years ago. James wrote the exact same thing. How you use your words affects you and your life. It's, it's interesting that that's what we are finding today. Sometimes, though, the problem is you did not set out to lie. You started, and the more you talked, the more the story changed, the more the details advanced and became different and, and more and, and more fascinating and, and more dramatic. Maybe you did not intend to hurt with your words or maybe you did not intend to cut down, but the more you talked, the worse it got. The key could be maybe in the middle of your next sentence to say, wait. Just to stop and say, wait. The question is, not just the word wait, but why am I talking? Just for you to stop in the middle of your sentence and then find out from yourself, why am I still talking? It could be just the pause you need to figure out why you're saying what you are saying. Thirdly, James says, no human being can tame the tongue. We actually need God's help for this. He actually puts it this way. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Have you ever said to yourself, I will never lie again? And that statement in itself was a lie. <laughs> Have you ever promised never to raise your voice again or to use your words to hurt people, the people you love and the people you care for? Have you ever promised not to laugh at those jokes again or promised never to say those jokes again? And then you found yourself right back 
at it again and again and again. James is telling us here that the tongue is a restless evil and none of us can tame it. He's, he's trying to remind you again that it takes God to start the transformation process. It takes you submitting to God for him to do it. We know we cannot achieve it by ourselves because we have tried to achieve it by ourselves and we have failed. We actually need God's help for this. We need to ask God to make it possible for us to reel in our words. See, as I was continuing to study on the research, I found that there's, there's a psychologist who actually says that children learn how to lie by themselves. They, they actually found that uh, it's, they say particularly that it is actually what they consider as a psychological milestone when a child knows how to lie. Because it means that the child's brain has grown to that level of knowing, if I change my words, I change the outcome of this conversation. The child has realized that by me not saying the truth, I avoid the consequences of the truth. So the child lies. No one taught you how to lie. You just needed to figure out the consequences to truth, and I'll say it differently. While a child may learn how to lie by themselves, a child learns how to shout from watching us. A child will learn how to insult by watching us. A child will learn how to curse by watching us. A child will learn how to tear people down with words by watching us. Yes, they may learn how to lie by themselves, but every other thing is taken down by them watching their uncles, their aunties, the adults around them, and the conversations at the dinner table. They pick it up from us, and we pass on our struggles. As we are struggling to bridle our own tongues, we are passing on the same struggle to the future generations. And, and, and James is trying to remind us again and again that our words have an impact. Our words change people, and they change our lives as well. Lastly, James says this, words put to question our reputation. In essence, words show who we really are. Says this from verse 9 to 12, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Sometimes it becomes very hard for us to invite friends and colleagues and family to church because they struggle with understanding how the same mouth that has cast, told, to, caused jokes, uh, torn them down from Monday to Thursday, suddenly inviting them to worship God on Friday. <laughs> Are your friends and colleagues afraid to be around you because they do not know what you will say and how your words will affect them? Are they afraid of what you will say? Are they afraid of sending you a report in the office because they do not know what your response will be? Are people afraid of you because of how you use your words? Maybe you're seated here today thinking, well, I don't use my words to tear other people down. And that may be so. But the worst way we use words is when we use words against ourselves. How many of us spend hours in the night saying to ourselves, I am a failure. I am not good enough. I will never achieve it. I will never make it. Or I don't deserve this. How many of us spend time tearing ourselves down with the words we speak when no one else is listening? Sometimes how we speak to ourselves ends up changing our character so much that we start tearing others down so that we can feel better about ourselves as well. You see, we need to ask God to help us on how we use our words, not only towards others, but also towards ourselves. 
I, I love how the psalmist says it. The psalmist, uh, if there is anyone in scripture who knows the impact of words, it is the psalmist because he writes beautiful music for God. But then this is what he says of himself in Psalms 141 verse 3. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. The psalmist knows that he does not have a proper control over his words and he desires the help of God to watch what he says, how he says it, and when he says it. He wants God to set a guard over the door of his lips. So when, when I was getting married, my mentor told me two things. He said, I have two pieces of advice for you. One, I want you to, to learn how to do this. Never use the word, blanket statements. Don't use them. Don't use words such as never or always when you're talking to your wife. Don't say to her, you never do this or you always do this. I'm like, ah, that's easy. I will do that. Five years later, I'm still trying not to use the words never and always when we are arguing. The next thing he said is, don't say anything you'll have to apologize for later. Like, wow, that's so easy. No, it's not. What that simply means is the more and every single time I have a conversation with my wife, I have to physically place a guard in my mind where I go like, as I'm about to say something, will I have to apologize for this later? And then that idea permeated every other conversation I have with everyone else around me. And maybe for us, it could be that simply asking God to help us set such a guard in our minds and in our hearts to say, will I have to apologize for these words later could be what we need. And why do we need to do this? You see, Paul, as he continues to write, he writes to the Ephesians and he says this to them. Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Uh, Paul is trying to tell these guys and telling us by extension that you were not saved by what you have done. It was actually you have been saved by what Jesus Christ did on the cross. He is the one who did everything for you. He is the one who saved you. And, and Paul is trying to remind them, and he continues and says, not as a result of work so that no one may boast. Paul is trying to say it's not about you standing before people saying, hey, look at me. Look at how much I've changed. Instead, is look at what God has done through me. It's not by work so that no one can boast. But then Paul continues with this idea, and he says, for we are his workmanship. That is, whether you are a follower of Christ or not, you are God's workmanship. And then he continues and he says, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Simply put, if you are a follower of Christ, then you are walking in the good works that God created you for. If you are not a follower of Christ, it, you are God's workmanship, but you are missing out on what he created you for. And then he continues and he says, um, prepared for you beforehand that we should walk in them. Uh, these good works that God prepared for us beforehand start with how we use our words. And then we're going to sing a song in a short while. The song will, will show us how God uses his words and our response to God using his words. And, and it's the, the question I would like you to have today is uh, think about how you use your words and how they have an impact on others. But also consider how God uses his words and what he does with his words. And, and I want you to consider what your life has been done or what God has done in your life by his words. Maybe for you today, it will not be for you to come forward for prayer. Maybe for you today it would be to sit in your seat before going out and text a few people and tell them, I'm sorry for how I've used my words against you. Maybe for you it's not to go home before you call a few people and tell them, today I realized how my words affect you and I'm not going to leave until I make a change. Maybe for you it could be that you'll walk to the front and ask for someone to pray with you certain words that will completely transform your life. And those words would be, Jesus, I am a sinner, forgive me. If ever there were words you could use to transform your lives, it would be the words for you to submit your life back to the Lord. Let us pray together.
Father, I thank you so much for your son. I thank you for what he did on the cross. And I thank you that it is through what he did that we can stand before you today in thanksgiving, saying that you have transformed our lives, saved us by grace uh, through faith in Christ Jesus. Lord, today we want to pray like the psalmist saying, Lord, please set a guard over my mouth and keep watch over the door of my lips. And Lord, I pray that we shall learn how to submit our words to you over and over again. Lord, I pray if there are those who are here with us who do not know you and who would love to know you and start a relationship with you, Lord, I pray that they would say those very important words, words that will transform their lives. Father, I submit my life to you. And for those of us who are here who words have either ruined marriages, ruined families, and today, Lord, as we think about it, Lord, I pray that you shall start giving us new words to start rebuilding those things. Lord, I pray that you will help us realize that you have already forgiven us and you uh, can give grace to those who have heart to forgive us as well. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen.